Do you have a paranormal encounter you'd like to share with us? Send us an email with your story for a chance of it being featured on Weird World. Some spirits seem to frequent only a particular location which is significant in the sometimes traumatic reenactment of their life journey. Here, Weird World viewers give personal accounts of three of these haunting or time slip presences. The Hanging Judge From a young child, Keith Macy worked as an actor in TV and film productions. One night in 1985, after a long day of filming out on location on a London weekend television production called Dutch Girls, the cast arrived back by coach at the LWT studios, by then at around 11pm. Keith phoned home to let his mum know he was ready to be picked up, and she said that she and his dad were on their way. As it was a pleasantly clear and warm night, Keith told them to look out for him along the strand, as he would set off on foot. He was walking along the road opposite the high courts and just happened to see two men walking towards him some distance apart. The first man was dressed normally, but the second one was wearing the full judge's outfit and wig and was carrying a swathe of papers tucked under his arm. The first man was very close to Keith and passed him, and there was a single lane side road, so Keith looked down as he stepped off the curbstone. He then looked back up and froze on the spot as he realised that the judge had completely vanished. Keith turned around, half expecting to see the figure behind him, even though he knew that there was no way he could have got from about 30 feet in front of him to being behind him in the two to three seconds when he had looked down and back up again. The only person walking away from him was the man that he had just passed. The only place that the judge could have gone into was an open doorway that had a light on inside, but that was about 12 feet behind him when Keith had last seen him. Despite this again being not possible, Keith rushed towards that doorway and found it was a very tiny tavern. He went inside and the only person in there was the landlord washing the floor. Keith asked him if anyone had just come in, and he said no, that the place was closed, but he was working late as he had been redecorating and was just cleaning up. Keith explained about the judge, but didn't think the man believed him, so just carried on walking, and about five minutes later, his parents arrived in their car. Keith told them about the strange sighting, and, believing their own son, they said it was very odd. A few days later, Keith's mum came home with a book from their local library about the ghosts of London. They found a reference to an apparition called the Hanging Judge. He had been killed by a convicted man he had sentenced, near the area where Keith had seen the man, dressed in exactly the same way as it was described in the book. Keith still recalls the figure he saw looking very solid, with its feet walking on the ground, and that he saw him approaching very clearly. Whether a ghost or a time slip, it was a very strange and mystifying experience. An untimely end. Peter Smythe had this experience one wet and stormy morning in February in the early 1990s. The storm was the reason why he wasn't out fishing, but instead taking his dog for a walk over the golf course at Ardglass in County Down in Ireland. Peter and his dog Bobby, an English bull terrier, reached the back nine of the golf course, where the ground ahead is lower than the first nine holes. This is where he immediately saw in the distance a stocky man standing with his back turned in their direction. The figure was maybe 60 or 70 metres to their left. Otherwise, the course was deserted due to the lousy weather which the dog owner simply has to endure. Peter had intended to skirt along the top edge of the golf course and take a right turn down to Coney Island Beach. However, as they walked along, he found himself wondering who the old man was. He knew everyone in the village nearby, and this man was a stranger to him. 
He was also sure that the man was quite old because he was bent over and just standing there leaning on a stick. As they got closer to him, with him still on their left, Peter could see that he was wearing an old-fashioned long coat, almost to the ground, and a cap with ear flaps. Peter asked himself what he would be doing out there on such an inclement day and wondered if there might be something wrong with him. He didn't want to give the man a shock but knew he had to check out if he was okay and decided to change direction and turn left to walk past him. It was around this time that Peter found it strange that although they had walked quite a bit and were now approaching the figure from a different angle, his back was still facing them. Peter hadn't seen him move at all, even though he had kept his eyes on him as they walked along. They were now heading directly towards him. Bobby was running around as usual, sniffing here and there, and Peter's priority now was to not startle the man. He was concerned that he could have a heart attack if he suddenly saw them there beside him. And beside him they almost were, with Bobby now on Peter's right and in front of the man, whose back was still facing Peter. Peter walked past behind him, thinking that he must see Bobby and look around for the owner. He was now only about three metres behind the man, and Bobby four or five metres in front of him. Thirty or forty metres ahead of them was an old cottage, which now houses some machinery for the golf club. There were no bushes or trees near them, just mown golf course grass. Peter was now convinced that the man simply didn't, for whatever reason, want him to see his face, but he thought that he might be interested in finding out who Peter was and maybe would sneak a glance at him. So when he was two or three metres past him, he quickly turned round to get a look at him, in the hope that he would also be observing Peter. But the man wasn't there, he had just vanished. Peter had thought he was as solid as anyone else when he had seen him, but now he had disappeared into thin air. Bobby had continued to sniff around the whole time without even showing any sign of having seen him at all. Peter found that unusual, as he normally acknowledged anyone they encountered, and he thought that dogs or animals in general are more sensitive than the average person anyway. Shortly after getting home, Peter's friend, also called Peter, rang the doorbell, and Peter had soon told him the story. He said that he would do some research and try to find out something about the man. A day or two later, friend Peter visited our witness again and said that he had gone to the church records. There he had read that a Mr Grimes had, decades before, lived in the old cottage before the golf course even existed. One evening he had been in a local pub where he was bragging about how much money he had at home. Two Scottish fishermen, who had believed his ramblings in the pub, had followed him home and had slain him. A day or two later, Peter questioned another friend, who told him that years before, he and Peter's cousin, when they were boys, had seen an old man walking towards them near the pub in the village. As the man passed them, they turned round to say something to him, but he was gone. Peter asked his friend what the old man was wearing and he gave him the exact description of the man he had seen on the golf course. The long coat, cap with flaps and using a walking stick, perhaps reenacting his last day in the fabric of time. The Lay-By Ghost Keith Macy wrote that before he was born, his dad Ronald was working for a company called British Road Services, or BRS. In the late 1950s, Ronald drove a lorry that pulled a large trailer, delivering goods all over the UK. One night he was on a main trunk road and the job involved a long run, from London to up north towards Scotland. He pulled over into a roadside lay-by to take a rest from driving. This was on a part of the road away from a town, so there were no houses nearby or even any street lighting back then. After a few minutes, he heard someone knocking on the passenger side door and Ronald leaned over and saw a man standing there. He was dressed in normal clothing and wearing a flat cap. Keith's dad wound down the window and the man asked him, Got a light, governor? He smoked woodbine cigarettes back then, so he replied, yes, mate, and he leaned aside in order to reach his lighter 
and then back over to the window. However, disconcertingly, the man was nowhere to be seen. Ronald then got out of the cab and walked all around the lorry and trailer, but there was no sign of the man anywhere. He thought it was strange, but he set off again on the journey to drop off the goods. On his way back, he stopped off at a truck stop cafe to get breakfast and told a couple of other lorry drivers he knew who used the cafe regularly about the strange man. They both looked at each other but did not say anything. Ronald asked why they were acting weirdly and they asked him to confirm once again where the lay-by was. This he did and they said, so you have seen him too. He found out that this man had been witnessed by several lorry drivers over the years who had pulled into that same lay-by late at night. The somewhat inoffensive phantom always knocks on the door and the only thing he says is to ask, got a light, governor? Then he disappears. Keith's dad told him the story many years before he died in 2000, so Keith is unable to remember the number of the main A road, although he will never forget the details of the event. His father was an ex-RAF flight sergeant who had flown in Lancaster bombers on the Berlin airlift, and after Keith was born, he worked for Royal Mail, working his way up to an executive position. He was therefore very logical and not one for imagining things, so Keith knows that when his dad said he saw the man, he did, just like so many other truck drivers had done. Why the strange presence was hanging around the remote lay-by remains a mystery 